Hello, I'm Peter Van Dusen, and this is another campaign edition of Primetime Politics on CPAC. This is day 31 of the election campaign, Election Day Monday. 5.7 million Canadians have already voted in the advance polls. We learned that today. That's a more than 18% jump over 2019. It's been a day of more personal attacks as a nastier tone takes hold in the final days of the contest. Coming up, along with focusing on each other, the leaders play up promises on childcare, on cutting cell phone and internet rates, and on climate change. We'll debate the latest developments with candidates, and pollster David Coletto joins us again to look at how the race is unfolding. But first, to the day on the campaign trail. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh campaigned again today in Ontario, in key ridings where the NDP looks to hold seats or win new ones. At a stop in Toronto, Singh returned to a common NDP theme in this election, the rising cost of living. And he slammed Liberal leader Justin Trudeau over the cost of cell phone service for Canadians, promising an NDP government would cap fees, mandate unlimited data plans, and break up cell phone monopolies to lower prices. Voting for Mr. Trudeau is going to cost you. It's going to mean that he's going to continue to not take on the big telecom companies, allow them to exploit you. The polls continue to show a tight race between Conservatives and Liberals and point to the likelihood of another minority government. But Singh keeps deflecting questions about which party he would support in a minority government in an effort to keep NDP supporters from flocking to the Liberals as they did in 2019 in an effort to block a Conservative win. So I'm wondering, are you willing to prop up the Liberals or the Conservatives in order to avoid Canada going back into an election during this pandemic in the next few months? I want Canadians to know when you vote for a new Democrat, what, what are you going to get? You're going to get someone who's going to fight for you. And our goal is to achieve, is to get the help that you need. And we've shown that in this pandemic. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole campaigned in the village of Russell, east of Ottawa, in a riding held by the Liberals, but which the Conservatives are targeting. He restated the promise to scrap the Liberal plan for $10 a day childcare across Canada and replace it with a tax credit system. Today, I announced my plan to secure childcare for Canadian families, to put parents back in the driver's seat when it comes to choosing the kind of options that work best for their kids to help lower income families today, not five years from now, with up to 75% of childcare expenses covered. But again today, most of O'Toole's scripted comments were aimed at Liberal leader Justin Trudeau, attacking the Liberal leader again and again for calling the election in the fourth wave of the pandemic and accusing him of dividing Canadians and fighting past battles with Conservatives. Just yesterday, Justin Trudeau was at it again, refighting the battles of the past, railing against a platform and a party that no longer exists anywhere other than in his imagination. It's not 2015, Mr. Trudeau. It's 2021. And people aren't interested in the past. They care about their future. Justin, maybe you should spend more time thinking about the next six years rather than the last. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau campaigned in British Columbia again. Tight battles and key ridings in the province could ultimately decide who forms government on Monday night. Trudeau talked up his climate plan again and warned the Conservative climate plan with commitments to the same targets as the Harper government will set Canada back. Conservative government under Stephen Harper that didn't understand that the only way to build a strong economy with good jobs is to fight climate change at the same time. And Mr. O'Toole and this newest version of the Conservative Party, they want to go exactly back to Stephen Harper's targets and Stephen Harper's approaches on the environment. And Trudeau also stepped up efforts to discredit Jagmeet Singh and pull progressive voters away from the NDP. Despite what Jagmeet Singh and the NDP say, it does make a difference whether or not there's a Conservative or a Liberal government. And unfortunately, the NDP not only is not leading on that choice, but they didn't step up on the fight against climate change. The Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette made a campaign stop in the Magdalen Islands in the same riding he's visited three times now, hoping to unseat a Liberal cabinet minister who won there by less than 700 votes last time. Blanchette promised the Bloc would push harder for greater federal improvements to the local port. 
He also says a planned trip to New Brunswick today to speak to Acadian leaders about the challenges facing Francophone communities outside Quebec was cancelled after pressure from other Francophone organizations in the province. And Green Party leader Annamie Paul spent a second day with candidates in Prince Edward Island, where provincial Greens formed the opposition. Paul spoke about the results Greens get when they're elected. There is nowhere else in the country that an opposition party could have 14 pieces of legislation get through. I mean, I assure you, 14. <laughs> Climate Leadership Act, the Poverty Elimination Strategy Act, these are groundbreaking pieces of legislation uh, that are done when people across party lines are willing to come together and to cooperate and collaborate on behalf of people. We are here to be of service. And that's the kind of day it's been, day 31 of the campaign. Voting day, just six days away. So more personal attacks on the campaign trail today and parties holding out their differences over child care, climate change and cell phone costs. But really underlying everything we're hearing now in the campaign is about trying to frame the ballot question around which leader do you really trust? Let's bring in three candidates now to discuss the latest developments. Adam Vancouverton, the Liberal candidate for re-election in the Ontario riding of Milton. Michael Chongs, the Conservative candidate for re-election in the Ontario riding of Wellington Halton Hills. And Leah Gazan is the NDP candidate for re-election in the riding of Winnipeg Centre. It's good to see you all. Thanks for being here. Mr. Vancouverton, Justin Trudeau is now using Stephen Harper's name more and more in the final days of the campaign and warning Canadians that Aaron O'Toole's government would be Stephen Harper's government. Uh, why is he doing that? Well, I can't speak for Justin Trudeau, but I, I can say that the more that I look at the, uh, the Aaron O'Toole 2021 platform, the more I see the same old conservative stuff from, you know, a really a lack of ambition on fighting climate change, the same old tax credits that have never done anything to support lower income Canadians and help people fighting to be a part of the middle class. I see uh, a diminished, if anything, impact uh, of their platform to address important issues uh, like housing and, and poverty. Um, I see no real commitment to walk the path of truth and reconciliation. And, uh, and I see, unfortunately, for communities like mine, um, a heightened uh, commitment to supporting the gun lobby. And this is just not things that Canadians support. It's not something okay. that I'm hearing at the doors uh, that Canadians support. So I suppose it's just more of the same from the Conservatives. Mr. Chong, Aaron O'Toole's uh, urging Canadians to punish Justin Trudeau by kicking him out of office for calling the election during the pandemic, saying he can't be trusted. Uh, but what about uh, this, connecting him to uh, Stephen Harper's policies? Uh, a lot of Conservatives like the Stephen Harper policies on climate, and uh, Mr. O'Toole would keep the same targets. Uh, uh, he would make direct payments to families on child care, as was the case under the Harper government. Uh, so why isn't the analogy fair? Well, quite simply, because we've done the heavy lifting within our party to change our position on climate change. We spent a lot of time consulting across the country and came forward with a robust plan to reduce emissions. It partly builds on the current government's plans, but it takes a different approach in other areas. And the plan's been vetted by experts and praised as a good, coherent plan to take us toward 2030. On childcare, we believe that our plan is a much better plan because, quite simply, for this reason, it will immediately provide relief for low- to middle-income families across the nation without, uh, that, that takes into account uh, the different kinds of families out there, that takes into account that Canadian right. families live in urban and rural areas, that not everybody works nine to five, that people work shift work, and that people have different daycare needs. Look, the current government has promised childcare, a national childcare system, since 1993. They've trotted out okay. in six or seven of the last number of elections, and they each and every time fail to deliver. All Canadians right. are not going to believe them this time. Uh, Leah Gazan, Justin Trudeau again appealed today to progressive voters to abandon the NDP, saying Liberals are the only ones who can stop a return, as he put it, to the Harper era under the Conservatives. So the Democrats have seen this movie before. So how do you stop it from happening again? Oh, and, and you're absolutely right. I've seen this movie for over 150 years of Conservative and Liberal governments, both governments who have never, ever met a climate target. Uh, we have the worst uh, emissions, GHG uh, reduction effort in all G7 countries right now. And in fact, the Liberal government uh, during uh, the, the, the pandemic gave, in fact, $120 million to wait in wage subsidies to Imperial Oil and paid out $324 million 
uh, in dividends to their wealthy shareholders. This government is not serious about climate change. The Liberals mm. came out after almost 30 years uh, saying they're put it, pushing forward a national child care strategy. They decided to call an election uh, instead. And we've seen the rights of children, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, being violated by a failure of consecutive conser conservative and liberal governments to provide proper telecom okay. services to people. But, but what's the country. what's the singular message to progressives to say, look, you don't need to cross the street to, to liberals here. What's what's the message you have for them? Well, we know that the liberals particularly have a history of campaigning on the left. Uh, and governing on the right. One only has to look at all the corporate bailouts okay. that happened during the pandemic, not to people, but to corporations, all right, to so know the, that we have a pattern of behavior in this country. All right, Mr. Vancouver, in the Liberal uh, uh, campaign of late, in this appeal to progressive voters again to abandon the NDP to block Aaron O'Toole from winning, uh, that's being described by opponents as an act of desperation. How do you respond to that? Well, when you, you don't have to look to liberals to see people, uh, you know, lauding the, the liberal platform on the environment and climate change. And I will acknowledge that my friend from Huntington Halton Hills has been a strong voice for the environment and climate change from within the Conservative caucus. But I would argue that he hasn't really made too much of an impact because uh, the Andrew Weaver, for example, and, and many other um, experts across the country consistently give the Conservative platform on in the environment and climate change failing grades, whereas ours has received uh, praise from former Green leaders, from former NDP leaders. Uh, our plan to address the environment and climate change is is real. It's it's achievable. It's ambitious, and it's uh, it's ratified by experts. So you don't have to rely on liberals to tell us uh, to tell Canadians that uh, our platform is the best. You can look at you know experts in the housing industry. You can, pardon me. You can look at experts in uh, in the environment and climate change and and economic. And economists as well. Um, you know, we're not alone in saying that we have the best path forward right, and we have the best plan for Canada's future. Mr. O'Toole, I want to ask a little bit about health care here. Aaron O'Toole sent a letter to the Quebec Premier telling him uh, he will negotiate compensation for Quebec for cancelling, uh, sorry, uh, daycare, the Liberal daycare plan. Eight provinces have signed on to the plan. And I guess a lot of people are wondering today, why aren't Conservatives promising to compensate the other seven provinces for cancelling the Trudeau child care plan? Is that something that should be talked about? Well, first off, we've said we'll honour all the existing agreements that have been struck between the government of Canada and the provinces. Uh, for but one year, believe, for the first year. Yeah, those agreements right. uh, are, are in place and we'll honour those agreements as they have been struck by the current government. Um, but we think that a better approach is to provide direct assistance immediately to low to middle income families across the country. Look, since 1993, we have had nine general elections. And in the last nine general elections, the Liberals have trotted out this promise of a national child care program in six of the last nine general elections. And they have failed to deliver right. since 1993. It's been almost 30 years. And Canadians are not going to fall for it a seventh or sixth or seventh time. It's simply not going to happen. So that's why we think our plan, which will deliver immediate relief, is a much better plan. And I might add... Where's the pharma care promise? It's not even in their platform. They promised in 2015 and again in 2019 to roll out a national pharma care program. They've abandoned that promise. All right, so, so let's, their let's, child care promise is simply not. Okay, before. Leah Gazan, let me drill down on, on the trust issue here and, and weave in this part of the conversation. The polls show the Conservatives and Liberals uh, at this point fighting it out for government. And I guess which one of those two parties would you be prepared to support? Would the NDP NDP be prepared to support in a minority parliament. So that, that talks about the issue of trust. And one of these two, according to the polls, uh, parties is likely to form government. I know New Democrats maybe don't want to hear that, but that's what the polls suggest. And a lot of people want to know who you're going to support if it's a minority parliament. Well, look, I'm running to form government. Uh, certainly, uh, we know the orange way, for example, uh, during Jack Layton's time that, you know, Things can change on a dime. We've certainly seen that elect during this election. New Democrats have worked hard uh, in the last parliament, working with all parties across the way, fighting for Canadians. That will not shift. That will not change. No matter who forms government, as of, yet, as of now, uh, we are running to form government. And, you know, we will let Canadians decide. 
uh, who they want to be the next government uh, on September 20th. But, but couldn't the NDP benefit, some would say, uh, to have voters know what the bottom line is for the party now, if you have a minority parliament? What are the programs you would demand and hold to? Is national child care, stiffer climate targets, pharmacare? Could putting those bottom look, lines out there now actually result in higher support for the NDP? No, look, look, we had put, uh, even in the last parliament before this unnecessary election was called, uh, certainly a universal pharmacare, both conservatives and liberals uh, voted it down. We proposed a wealth tax, conservatives and liberals uh, shot it down. We fought to get the SIR payments higher. Uh, we were successful, you know. We fought for sick leave, sick, paid sick leave. Now the liberals are talking about okay. it in the platform. We're, we're fighting to uh, form government and whatever happens, we will continue to fight for people uh, in Canada. All right, I need very, very quick answers here from you, and it's on this final issue of the vaccinations have been polarizing in this campaign. The, the Prime Minister, uh, Liberal leader, uh, responded to a protester uh, at an event last night, uh, verbally went after an anti-vaxxer, uh, saying, isn't there a hospital you should be going to bother right now because the, the attacks were on uh, the Liberal leader's uh, spouse. Mr. Vancouverden, uh, how, what do you think of his reaction? Well, I think we're all kind of frustrated with the degree of vitriol that's come from a lot of these protests. And I think members from every party can acknowledge that things like throwing rocks and protesting in front of a hospital are absolutely atrocious and they shouldn't be happening in Canada. Very, very briefly, I'd just like to address the fact that child care in a national program okay. is not just a promise. It's also a all reality right. in six provinces uh, in one territory, right. as Mr. Chong, care is in PEI. So we are making Mr. Chong, what, what do you think of the prime minister's reaction, first of all, and his suggestion that the, the protester go, go protest in front of a hospital? Well, it's it, frankly, it's understandable and condemn, you know, the violence we've seen, the, you know, the inappropriate behavior we've seen, not just directed toward the prime minister, but directed toward healthcare workers and our public healthcare system. It's simply unacceptable. And, you know, in a free and democratic society, we solve our differences through free speech and debate, not through the threat of violence or through the throwing of of projectiles okay. or through misogynistic behavior like we've seen recently. Uh, Leah Gazan, let me give the last word to you and what you thought of the, uh, uh, Justin Trudeau's reaction to that protester. Well, I think there's absolutely no place for violence. You know, healthcare workers have not just put themselves, but also their families on, on the line. Uh, we need to hold up healthcare workers right now who continue to fight on the front lines of the pandemic. And, you know, we can make decisions at the ballot box. There's no place for violence right. uh, in this country. Okay. Thank you all for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Good luck to all of you. And uh, thank you so we'll much. Get a chance to talk again. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Take nice care. To see you, Leah and Michael. Nice to, yep, yes, you nice to see you all. Bye bye. <laughs> Well, let's get a latest look at the polling landscape now with David Coletto, CEO of Abacus Data, who's been with us throughout the campaign uh, to give us his insights on what voters are saying and feeling about the issues and the leaders. David, good to see you again. Uh, first of all, what do we need to know about the context for these latest survey numbers? So good to see you, Peter. This survey uh, was completed entirely after both the French and English language debates last week. We were in the field from Friday until Sunday interviewed 2,000 eligible voters uh, across the country, and it's representative of, of that population. Um, so a good national sample that we can dig into here. All right, let's look at the numbers. Uh, we know it's been a tight race between the Conservatives and the Liberals. Uh, what's the latest? Still a tight race. Uh, tied still, uh, same as last week. We've got 32 for the Conservatives, 32 for the Liberals, 21 for the New Democrats, uh, six for the Bloc, four for the People's Party, who are now ahead of the Greens just slightly we're at three and then 2% for, for other parties. And you can see there um, the change from last week is, is marginal at best. So, you know, in our tracking, we basically have, a, have had a frozen race um, over the past two weeks. When we look at that graph that, uh, that gives us a look at the change in support over time, uh, you can see that the three main parties have sort of seen their support plateau nationally, right? Yeah. Yeah. There, there doesn't seem to be much momentum for, for any of the three major parties. I mean, the Conservatives. Um, in the first few weeks of the campaign, we're able to get uh, neck and neck with the Liberals, but, but neither have really been able to break free. And the New Democrats are, have been stuck around the low 20s uh, for the entirety of the campaign. So in my mind, that's a big part of this story is that, you know, uh, despite some early movement, there hasn't been, at least in our tracking, some of the other polls have showed more movement. But in the, 
But in our weekly poll, we haven't seen much move uh, one way or the other. The real story is told in those key battleground provinces. Uh, that's what we'll all be watching on Election Day, where the parties need to grow support to win. So what are we seeing in the provinces and regions in terms of support with less than a week to go before Election Day? Yeah, so a national tie um, obscures the fact that the Liberals, I think, in this poll still have an advantage. And Why? Well, they're competitive in British Columbia, where we see a three-way race. The Conservatives continue to do very well in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. But look at Ontario and Quebec. The Liberals have a seven-point lead in Ontario over the Conservatives, 38 to 31, with the New Democrats in third. And then in Quebec, they've opened up a seven-point lead over the Bloc, 36% to 29. So those two big provinces account for a clear majority of all the seats in the House of Commons. If the Liberals have these kind of numbers headed into uh, next Monday, election night, they're going to feel more confident that at least they can win the most seats. Finally, in Atlantic Canada, we are seeing some evidence of a, perhaps a tightening race there. It's a smaller sample size, so don't get hung up on, on the margin. Uh, but a number of other polls that have come out this week are, are also showing perhaps um, not as big a sweep uh, for the Liberals in Atlantic Canada. But we'll, we'll still have to wait and see uh, on, on Election Day on that one. All right, let's look at this next slide, because I suppose it's better news for the Liberals from the trend that had been developing. Let's look at the desire for change. What's happening there? Yeah, so again, four lines, as we've shown over the last few weeks, that top line is the most important. It's the percentage of people who say they definitely want a change in government. As you said, it trended upwards throughout the summer and into the campaign. But for the last four waves of our research, it has more or less been stuck just below 50%. And if you look to the far left of that screen, back in 2019, 52% at the end of the 2019 campaign uh, definitely wanted a change in government. So we're still below that number. And I think it's a signal that although the opposition parties, Mr. O'Toole, Mr. Singh, have been, I think, successful at raising questions about why we're having an election, they haven't done enough to prosecute the case for change. And so if I'm the Liberals, I'm watching this number closely over the next few days, because if it gets above 52, then they get into real, uh, that's a real trouble zone for them, because it's going to be hard uh, to, to win if, if so many people are really looking for a change in government. And this next graphic on vote by desire for change. I explain what we're looking at in these numbers. So again, we have four categories of, of kind of levels of change. So at the top there, those who definitely want a change in government, you can see very few of them say they would vote liberal. Most would vote conservative and, and new Democrat. Uh, for that next category, it's really interesting category. It's about 20% of the electorate. And they say change would be nice, but it's not important to them. And you can see why, because a plurality of them would actually vote liberal. So they're saying, I'd like change, but I have no real desire uh, to have it. Um, and then the bottom two categories are those who say they'd like to keep, keep the liberals, one more aggressively than the other. And you can see they overwhelmingly vote liberal. And again, back to the challenge for, the, for, for Mr. O'Toole is that he really needs to get people moving from that second change group, change but not important, up to the first, because you can see what happens when you move up there. You, you almost, none of them are going to vote liberal, far more of them vote conservative. Right. So he hasn't done enough at this stage. Uh, you know, this isn't, doesn't feel like a change election. It hasn't reached that point. And I think it might be because he keeps going on about how this election is unnecessary. And if it's unnecessary, then for some voters, it might signal, well, maybe Mr. Trudeau should actually stay in power. Okay, let's turn to some numbers that uh, I think are pretty important because they speak to the effect of the, uh, effectiveness of the support for parties. In other words, not just support, but who's actually going to exercise the franchise and cast a ballot to back up that support. So what's in those numbers and why are they so important? So among those who say they are definitely going to vote, uh, and now, you know, coming out of this weekend, many of them are already voted because of the advanced polls being open and mail ballots being available. We find that the Conservatives actually have an advantage among this group. And so this is one of those key variables we're going to be watching closely as we get towards election day is what is turnout? We already have some indication, perhaps, that early or advanced uh, voting over the weekend might have been slightly higher than 2019. That doesn't mean overall turnout is going to be high, uh, because in some of the other indicators, we see that, that enthusiasm, as we'll see in a minute, isn't as high. But what this shows is that right now, among those who are most motivated to vote, Conservatives actually have a slight advantage. So you go from a tie mm. to a four-point conservative lead, which makes it harder for the Liberals to get reelected in, with these numbers and gives the Conservatives a better shot at perhaps winning the most seats in the House. All right, this next slide's about expectations. You asked which party people think will win regardless of, of who they actually support. What did you find there? 
So here we haven't seen much movement. Um, more people think the Liberals are still going to win this election than the Conservatives. For a number of weeks, we had seen this number tighten. When it started, when this campaign started, it was 48 Liberal, 18 Conservative. So now it's under 10 points, but um, that, that, that momentum shift has changed. Now, people do recognize, um, regardless of who they think is going to win, that it's going to be close. And that might be an indicator that turnout might be higher. People we know are more likely to vote if they perceive this election to be close. It also could affect strategic voting. If you're someone inclined uh, to want to see a liberal government over a conservative one, but you might be inclined to vote NDP, if you think the conservatives are going to win, that might push you back to vote liberal to stop that outcome you don't want. Okay, uh, look, let, let's turn to the impressions of the leaders, what voters think about them. We've been charting this all through the campaign. What's happening right now? So not a whole lot of change, uh, an indicator that the debates really didn't change much. We'll talk about the debates in a moment. Uh, but Mr. Trudeau's got about equal numbers, positive and negative. That's been pretty steady for the entire campaign. Uh, Mr. O'Toole has about equal numbers negative as, as, the, as the Liberal leader, but you can see nine points fewer who say they like him. Um, Mr. O'Toole's numbers have improved, but not quite enough that he's on par with, 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 the, with Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Singh remains, you can see, uh, very popular. Um, these numbers are about where he was in 2019, so, so not a fundamental different place that, had, that didn't convert into a lot of votes last time for him. Um, and it's so far, he's kind of hit that ceiling around 20%. I just included Max Bernier, the People's Party leader in this, this chart this time, uh, because if there is one party that seems to have a little momentum, it might be the People's Party. Our poll is not picking up sort of the higher numbers that some of the others are. But you can see Max Bernier, there's very few people across the country who say they like Max Bernier, 12%, compared to almost half who view him negatively. So he is, is not a well-loved uh, individual, but is seemingly connecting with enough people that it, it's converting into to more support for the People's Party today. All right, let's uh, go back to the debates and, and see where we've come from there. And I want to just jump ahead to the impressions of the performances from the leaders. Uh, who did most to earn votes? Who, did, who, you know, who may have uh, lost support? What are we seeing there? Well, the indicators are that no one really won and no one really lost. So when we ask people who did the most to earn your vote, you can see Mr. Trudeau uh, is just slightly ahead of Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Singh. All of them are kind of bunched up together, indicating that those who are already inclined to like Mr. Trudeau thought he did good and vice versa for, for Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Singh. So no one really stood out as, as, as performing exceptionally well. And on the flip side, when we ask who did the most to lose your vote, well, it's the top two again, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. O'Toole. You know, Mr. a little bit more for Mr. Trudeau, but he's more polarizing a figure. These two data points, plus all the others that we looked at, signal to me that these debates really didn't have mm. an impact in changing uh, people's minds. It maybe just reinforced them. And I think that's reflected in the fact that the polls really haven't moved in other metrics since those debates. As well. All right. One, one last slide here, an important one that speaks to voter turnout and the depth of support for a party. What did you find there? If you remember earlier, I said among those definite voters, the, the conservatives, you know, gain and their, their lead grows. So this slide shows the, the, the number of each party supporters who say they're definitely going to vote. And just the, the key takeaway here is conservative supporters and right now bloc supporters are more likely to say they're definitely going to vote than those who would support the liberals or the new Democrats. Not huge differences, but when this race is so close. When, you know, uh, dozens of votes, perhaps in some writings, might be the difference between one candidate winning and another, turnout, as always, could be the big factor in how this election uh, ultimately unfolds. All right. And the final word from you on the, the upshot. What's the upshot out of these numbers? So close, Peter. It is, it's hard to say what's happening. Um, you know, these numbers haven't moved all that much. Question is, are voters starting to pay more attention? Does that mean those numbers are going to move? They're going to start making their decisions? Or if people pretty much locked in their views that there's really nothing the leaders can do for the rest of this week that are going to move it. We won't know until Monday night um, and as, as those ballots get counted. But this election continues to, to confound, I think, a lot of people's expectations when it was first called. All right, David Coletto, a big thank you as always. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Peter. And that's all the time we have for this campaign edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Peter Van Dusen. From all of us here at CPAC, thanks for watching. Take care.